Good morning. Good morning. I uh, was hoping to be able to tell you that they uh, saved the best to last, but I'm not sure that that's the absolute truth because after hearing all the other testimonies, I can't say that one was better than the other because what God does in an individual's life is an amazing thing, no matter what the situation is. So it's with that that we're going to, I guess we have a speaker next week that's going to share his story, but this is the last, I'm the last of the locals here sharing our testimonies. So uh, let's start with prayer. Uh, first off, I want to welcome, there's a lot of new visitors. I met some out there this morning, and I'm so glad you're here. Uh, come back again, and you'll hear the anointing preacher of our pastor instead of my testimony, okay? And, uh, but I hope you're blessed by this. So, Lord, I'm asking that you would move in every heart here, and for everyone that may be watching on YouTube, that the words of our testimony will make a difference in people's lives will make them understand that you treat everyone the same, you love everyone the same, and that the things that you've done for me and for the others that we've heard about, that you can do it for them as well. So I'm asking you, open ears, open hearts, and let them hear the truth in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I was uh, preparing for this, I spent two days sitting... I mean, it wasn't two full days, but for several hours over two days, I sat down and wrote out uh, because a lot of the testimonies you hear started at their very childhood, working all the way up and everything. And so after my stack of papers, I started looking at them and realized after that I only had about an hour and a half's worth there. So... <laughs> I immediately realized, okay, I, I'm going to have to pare this way down because more than anything about my past or anything that I may have accomplished in Christ since then, I want you to hear about what Jesus did in me that made the change in my life, okay? So I pared it down to basically that story. So I will say this, that I didn't have a bad upbringing. I had a pretty good childhood. I was raised in a small town in South Texas, Harlingen, Texas. And uh, my parents were really nice people. Good Catholics, went to church every Sunday. Uh, upstanding in the community. Everything was good. I mean, I had one older brother that was, he's a great guy. I mean, you know. <laughs> but I will say this after really thinking about it over the years, I came out of that childhood at about 16 to 18 years of age with no faith in God. I had no use for God, no use for the Catholic Church, no use for religion in any shape, way, shape, or form. I came out with a sense of uh, that I wasn't very valuable and I couldn't accomplish much, although I can't ever recall my parents or my brother or anything laying that kind of stuff on me, you know. But somewhere I picked it up that I wasn't good enough. And I can't say that I earned, I mean, somebody laid that on me because I don't remember any of that. I had a nice childhood. But I came out with this sense of men operated in certain ways, you know. They smoked, they drank, they used profanity, womanized. They did those sort of things. And I, that was my concept of what I should be liked as a man, and so at age 18, that's what I started pursuing. And, uh, you know, I had a kind of an attitude. I wasn't particularly concerned about what anybody else thought of me and how I acted. I wasn't trying to gain recognition in the sense of gaining approval from people because of what I did. So I just went about it, going at it, and I... I just developed a pattern of living that way. And the uh, result, of course, didn't serve me very well. So 
it resulted in a, in a lot of problems I had. I had a couple of failed marriages as a result of it. And, uh, you know, didn't hold jobs very long, that sort of thing. A lot of job changes and all of that. So I had some great jobs. I, I mean, I worked the oil rigs. I worked the wheat harvest. I worked tugboat in the Gulf of Mexico. I did all kinds of great things, but just not for very long because I thought they had the problem. <laughs> anyway. So all of that culminated in a place where I finally wanted to just shuck off the past. I just wanted to do away with it. I didn't want to have all the baggage that I carried with me around that I thought was causing me to fail. So I thought if I went someplace where no one knew me, no one knew anything about me, I had no history there, you know, that whatever I told them they'd believe and I could kind of create a, 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 a new deal for myself and, and get a new fresh start on everything. And so that's how I got, when I arrived in Las Vegas, that was the plan. So I started that. I was here, I came here in 1972. Uh, I uh, got married once and divorced in a few years time, you know, after about two years I got married and about a year and a half later we got divorced. <laughs> and uh, so uh, what I discovered was uh, it wasn't working, okay? Now, I didn't have any clue that God had any interest to in me at all. And in fact, I had zero interest in any religion, especially Christianity. So when the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witnesses would come knocking on the door, you know, they, after I cursed them out, I'd slam the door in their face. That's the way I handled that kind of stuff because I had, didn't want to have anything to do with it. So it wasn't like I had any sense of needing God because I didn't. And uh, so I was going along, but one thing happened during that time. It was when I was married and... Uh, you all know me, I have horses, I love to ride, I love to train horses, I know a lot, I know something about horses, I won't say I, I know a lot, because it's hard to know everything about horses. But back in this, in 1974, I knew less than nothing about horses. And I went to this guy, had some horses, and we went for a ride, and we had an accident, and I wound up with my jaw broken getting kicked in the head by the horse. The horse fell down, I fell down, and when the horse was thrashing to get up, his foot hit me in the top of my head. A blow that could have easily crushed my skull and killed me on the spot. But instead, my jaw broke and took the brunt of the blow. So I didn't even have a fractured skull out of it. Now, I didn't know this at the time, but I could have easily died, and I believe sincerely that God was protecting me even then. But I was so unaware of it, it never even crossed my mind that that was a possibility. So I wound up with uh, this complete failure in Las Vegas. I was here for about four and a half years, so we're up to 19, uh, March of 1977. And so I was driving a taxi cab, driving for yellow cab here in town, right? You know taxi cabs. And so uh, I had uh, Fridays and Mondays off, and uh, I was planning, in my mind, I was building up a plan, and I was going to go to another place and start over again and try it again and just try to do it better than I did here. So that was my plan. So at that time, there was a place, it's not there any longer, I guess, but down on Maryland Parkway, you all know where the Meadows Mall, not Meadows, but uh, the Boulevard Mall on, on Maryland Parkway is. Well, there used to be, right across the street from there, there used to be a little shopping center with a Wonder World store in it. So Wonder World's been gone a long time, but we call that the Wonder World Shopping Center there. And in that shopping room, there was a little bar called the Serene Room. And I was a regular in the Serene Room. <laughs> Somebody knows the Serene Room. <laughs> uh, I, 
You know, I shot on their pool team, I bowled on their bowling team, you know, I hung out in the place all the time. So on my day off Friday, about 11 o'clock, I went over there, and there was hardly anybody there. There was just one guy and a couple of women in the place, and I started shooting pool with this fellow. And I just a casual acquaintance. I really didn't know the guy that well. But as we were playing pool, he started describing this relationship he had had with this young woman and how much they had fallen in love and how great it was and how everything was going well. And in fact, they had just moved in together. They were here, and he was just raving about how, how great it all was. So at the end of the game, we went over and sat down at the bar and had our drinks in front of us. And uh, the girl comes over and tells, says to him, There's, these girls want me to go shopping with them. Should I go? And he says, uh, well, you know, you can decide whether you go, go with them or not. And, you know, and she says, no, I want you to tell me whether I should stay with you or go with them. And she, he says, well, you're a big girl. You know, you decide whether you should go with them or stay here with me. It's okay, either way. And they just kept going on back and forth like this, over and over, over and over, and over and over, you know. It got, I was sitting there listening to this, and it got, I was thinking how ridiculous this is. And I had this thought, and the thought said, in my mind, this is ridiculous. Two people that are supposed to be so much in love, because it was obvious that one of them, tried, you know, each one of them was trying to, get the other to demonstrate love by saying, I want you to, I want to be with you. I want, you know. And I said, they're supposed to be so much in love with each other, but neither one of them is willing to admit it. So that's when it happened. Now I'm going to tell you this, as I go on with this story, I'm going to tell you I knew things. I, at the time, I had no understanding of how I knew them. But it was a knowledge that was unshakable, unchangeable, and just solid. So there's several things that happened in the next few minutes that I just knew with no explanation of how I knew or why I knew it, but I knew it, and I knew, could not shake it. I understand now, years later, what happened, but here's what happened. When I had that thought, I heard a man's voice behind me say, I've been trying to get you to admit it for years. And I turned, and as I was turning, I realized I just heard a voice in my ear that responded to a thought I had in my mind, right? And I turned, and there was no one there. And that's when I knew. I knew God had spoken to me. I knew that he was saying that he loved me. And I knew that I had to respond in some way. Now, like I said, I don't know how I got this great knowledge, but all of a sudden, it was there. And uh, I'm sitting on a bar stool in the bar in Las Vegas, you know. I'm shook to the bone, to the core. I, it, it just, I was completely stunned. I couldn't understand why anything like that would happen to me, to a person like me. You know, I turned back to the bar, and I'm sitting there, and my mind just starts racing. I'm trying to come up with some logical explanation of what just happened. I mean, I'm thinking things like, okay, I must be having a LSD flashback, you know, or... Uh, I must be hallucinating. And I thought, no, I've had hallucinations. And that, this was nothing like a hallucination, you know. So, I mean, you know, and I'm thinking, you know, I was raised Catholic. God doesn't talk to people like me. He talks to saints, not got people like me, you know. So I, I just was just going on and on like that over and over, trying to rationalize, explain, somehow shake it off. I mean, I... Quickly, the drink was gone, and I ordered another one and popped them, you know, and tried to shake this off. And I'm not sure how long I sat there, whether it was 10 minutes or 30 minutes, but I came to a place where I couldn't shake it off. I could not convince myself that it didn't happen, that it wasn't real. And so I got up and left the bar. Now, up to that point... I 
you know, drank excessively. I used a lot of profanity and everything. But when I left that bar, I was never drunk again after that day. When I left the bar, the profanity was gone from my language. Now, I didn't try to quit. It just disappeared. Now, I was in a great quandary because once I got home, I knew I needed to respond in some way, but I had no idea how. I never read the Bible. I never heard a sermon on salvation. I never heard an explanation of what being born again does. I never heard about uh, atonement or any of the, I had no knowledge of any of the biblical ideas about salvation. So I, I was at a complete loss as to what to do. I tried to remember some of the Hail Marys and Our Fathers I was taught as a kid, you know. But I couldn't get through them because I didn't remember all the words. And it didn't matter because every time I tried to talk to God about this thing that just happened to me, I found out something else that I knew. My sin was in the way. And I couldn't communicate upwards. So I was stuck. I, I, I didn't know what to do. I was... I was, it was almost panic, you know, because I was so frustrated of knowing that I've got God telling me he loves me and I need to respond and being unable to. So, you know, my ex-wife had been going to a local church. Uh, it was a charismatic church at the time. And, and so I called her on the phone on Saturday morning and said, let's get together. So we got together and I told her what happened on Friday. And so after I told her what happened to me on Friday, she, we planned on going to church at this church she was attending on Saturday, Sunday. So Sunday morning, we wind up and show up in the church. And there was one other thing that I was sure about God was is that he treated everybody the same, and which is still true. He does treat everybody the same. But so with that understanding, knowing that my sin kept me from communicating with God, I made the assumption that everybody in the church was in the same boat that I was in, yet they were communicating. And so rather than understanding that I had it wrong, I thought they did. Okay? So you know, the church we attended is a good church. There's nothing wrong with the church. And I'm pretty sure that they give an altar call every Sunday. But I didn't hear any of that. So I left there without any help, no change or anything. And, by the way, nobody shook my hand at the door and welcomed me into the place. I sat in the back, and as soon as it was over, I was gone, you know. So it's a completely different situation. But anyway... So now I'm still in the same boat. So Monday morning, I was, had another day off. I thought, well, they had, I'd been raised a Catholic, and they said it was the true church, so gosh, maybe it is. I don't know. So I opened a phone book to the Catholic churches, and the first one listed was St. Anne's, which is over on Maryland Parkway. So I called them, and I said, I'd like to talk to a priest, and they put a priest on, and I said, I would like to come and talk to you. And I was expecting an appointment, you know, sometime later in the week. And he says, come right over. So I packed up. And that morning, Monday morning, I found myself in the rectory of St. Anne's in this huge office. I'd say the office was probably like from this aisle to the wall and with ceilings this tall. Very plushly appointed, you know. Big desks, big fence, thick, deep chairs and all that. It was really quite an office. So anyway, he sits me down in one of these big chairs, pulls the chair up to me, and so I tell him the story about what happened on Friday. And after I told him what the story was, he didn't have much comment about it all, or any questions, really. I don't remember him interjecting anything into it. But anyway, at the end of that story, I said to him, I said, I don't understand why God would speak to somebody like me, you know, because of all the stuff I've done. And I kind of went into a list of some of the, not, not a complete list, because it would have been a lot longer, but I went into a list of some of the sins I'd been involved with, you know. And when I came to the end of that list, he 
I looked up in the corner of that big, tall, ceilinged office. Now, I'd seen crucifixes all my life, and they meant nothing to me. But when I looked into the corner of that big room, there was a life-size crucifix vision of Jesus on the cross. And when I saw that, I instantly knew I was forgiven. I instantly knew it was done. I knew that he had died for me, and I had never understood that before in my life. He died for me. I was forgiven. And joy welled up inside of me that I've never experienced before or since. Joy welled up inside of me that was just overwhelming me. Tears were flowing down my face because of the joy welling up inside of me. I was sitting there stunned to the core again by God and his forgiveness, you know. And I was sitting there just weeping, weeping with joy because it was so wonderful. I remember this huge feeling of this huge weight just rolled off of me. And I felt like I floated in the air. It was so light, you know. In fact, I actually looked down to see if I was still sitting in the chair. Because <laughs> I felt like I just went, whoa. You know, because this weight just left me. And it was the weight of sin. I know that. And I knew at that moment, I knew that I was forgiven. I knew nothing else about God. I knew two things. He loved me and he forgave me. Nothing else. The priest didn't know what was going on. He thought the tears were repentance. And so he's trying to get me forgiven through the, like if I was in a confessional box, you know, in the church. He missed it completely. He didn't know what was going on. So anyway, I walk out of that place. And I'm a new man. Everything changed. No more no more drunkenness, no more profanity, no more. And I, it was nothing that I did. It just happened to me. I walked out of there. The grass was greener. The sky was, I mean, all of that was true. It really happened. And I was, you know, refreshed, a new person with a whole change of outlook about life. Everything changed in that moment that God forgave me. And when it happened, I experienced it. I had no idea what to call it. I had no idea what the Bible said about it. I had no idea that it was supposed to happen, but it happened to me. So the result was that Monday happened to be the Monday before Easter Sunday. So in the Catholic Church, you know, they do this Passion Week, and so there's services every day, and it's big. They make a big deal about it, you know. So I'm in church every day now going through this. And I'm in this euphoria of God's grace and love and joy and forgiveness. And so I'm not seeing too much about what's around me. I'm just, just basking in all of this for the first week or two. So it was just a glorious moment in my life that just changed everything. I never had any thoughts of doing any of the bad stuff I ever did before. Never even occurred to me that I would act that way again, you know. And I knew that it had no, I had nothing to do with what had happened. I just participated because God was doing it and I was there. So during that time, somebody, and I wish I knew who, but I cannot remember who did this, but somebody said, you should be reading the New Testament in the Bible. And it sounded like a good idea, so I went over and bought a Catholic Bible, and I opened up the New Testament and started reading it. I couldn't believe it. I mean, they've made a couple word changes, but basically they haven't messed with the Scripture too much. So I read the New Testament through in probably less than a week. You know, I just was devouring the Word. And so when I would get to the verse that said, if any man be in Christ is a new creation, all the old things pass away and became, everything becomes new. I guess that's supposed to be on the screen. She's, she's quicker than me. I didn't say that. I forgot to tell you the passage was coming up. When I saw that scripture, I went, well, that's already happened to me. So this help, that was one of the things that helped me understand that the Bible's true because 
They're saying stuff that's supposed to happen is the stuff that already happened to me. When, when it said in there in, uh, uh, let me get my reference here. Uh, <clears throat> I'm way off my notes all of a sudden here. So in Ephesians 2.8, where it says, uh, uh, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that's not of yourself. It's a gift of God, lest any man should boast. I knew that was true. I had nothing to do with it. I knew that it happened because God made it happen, and he gave it to me. It was a gift he gave to me. I never did anything to earn that. I was never good enough, never, never, ever good enough. To earn that. So it was a great transformation and in an understanding of learning what the Bible was true because it was telling me about the experience I'd already had. It's not like I read it first and then experienced it. I experienced it first and then some, some wise scholar once said that a man with an experience is never at the mercy of a man with an argument. Because you know the experience is true. And you never have to give up what you know is true to somebody that just has an argument that says it's not. Anyway, a little side note there. That wasn't on my notes. <laughs> okay, so I went from there. Uh, now, after, you know, we're starting to get weeks and the first month go by and all that, so I'm starting to look around in church, you know, seeing what's going on besides, besides uh, this great thing that God gave me. And so I, I told the priest, I said, you know, when I go to church, it seems like I'm the only one that looks like they're happy to be there. <laughs> so maybe we could tell them about what happened to me so they could be happy too, you know. <laughs> and uh, the priest says, uh, that's not a good idea. We don't want to do that. He said, uh, if you want to be around people that are happy about, about going to church, go over to St. Michael's to Sales. They've got a charismatic group over there, and they seem to be happy all the time. <laughs> but don't do it here. <laughs> I'm serious. That's what he told me. I, and I didn't know any better, you know, I, so I went, off I went to St. Michael de Sales, which is over here on uh, Michael Way, uh, and so uh, I found this group, and yeah, they were happy to, ha happy to be together, and they were doing things differently, and they said they were born again, and, and, and by then I'm starting to read enough Bible to know what born again meant, and things like that, you know. And now they're telling me about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So it sounded like as I'm reading the scriptures, I'm agreeing that I something I need, you know. But again, no matter how many times they laid hands on me, I never got baptized in the Holy Spirit. It was a separate event that God did independently of any men when I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. So... Every step of my way in the Lord has always been that way, not really from the ministry of men, but directly from God. So one of the things that really helped me grow, there was a, the local radio station at the time, used to run a Christian radio station, used to run a program. Uh, remember, this is back in the 70s, the, right in the height of the big charismatic renewal in the church. And so they had some really great theologians and teachings going on. And this radio station ran a program daily that they called a conference speaker hour. And they would have one of these nationally known theologians speaking on the, the program every day. And so I listened faithfully and then at the, I'd go home and I'd go through my Bible and check it all out and make sure what I just heard on the radio lined up with the word. And when it did, I accepted it, and when it didn't, I didn't accept it. It was rare to find something that didn't line up. It was very good. But the good part about that is it formulated a theology in me that I would have never gotten just out on my own, you know. It was like getting a 
seminary education, I believe, because I developed a theology that that uh, that really has aided me in m much in the years since. So that was a big foundation of my faith. There was a, uh, a guy called the Bible Answer Man that had a program on the radio at that time, Bob DeVilbus. And so I started attending his church here locally. And he was killed in an auto accident, but uh, he had a big influence on my formulating my theology and understanding of things as well. So now there's a few other things that happened during that time because now what I've described to you is like the first nine months or six months of my walk with the Lord. I met Mary, my wife, who uh, some of you know or met. And uh, the other thing that happened was is as I was questioning the stuff about the Catholic Church, uh, I found that they didn't have answers. Uh, I mean, I would ask them questions, and they, they, they never gave me a single answer. None of the nuns, none of the priests were able to give me an answer. So what, what happened was is somebody, I mean, there was questions like this. If they said it wasn't a sin to eat meat on Friday, but when I was a kid, it was a sin to eat meat on Friday. I'm saying, so how can that be? Either it was a sin when I was a kid, and so therefore it still is, or it's not a sin now, so it never was. So either way, you can't have it both ways. You know what I mean? And, and they had no answer for that. So finally, after I kept bugging them about these questions, uh, one of the nuns sold me. None of them ever gave me a Bible or sold me a book, or gave me a book, but they sold me a book. It was called The Documents of Vatican II, a big paperback about this thick that had an English translation of the Latin of when they made all the major changes of uh, doctrines and rules and stuff in the church back in, I guess, in the 60s. So I sat down and read it. I read the entire book. But by this time, I was already on my fourth or fifth or sixth reading of the New Testament, right? So I've got a pretty good understanding of what the Bible says. So as I'm reading through this, I'm finding the discrepancies where they conflict with what the Bible says. And there was numbers of them. But the one that, that just iced the cake for me was this. And I, I can't probably quote, quote it verbatim, but it basically said this. In the documents of Vatican II, it said, Anyone who believes that the Catholic Church is the true church cannot be saved without keeping the laws of the church. And I went, well, that's a big enough lie I can't swallow. <laughs> so I know that it's not true according to the scripture, so I can't be a Catholic anymore. And so that's when I departed from the Catholic church. So I've always based my understanding of faith on what the Bible has to say. I don't follow men's, I try not to follow men's teachings. If you find a good guy that's pretty biblical, I'll, you know, I like him and I stay with him and I encourage him and do things like that. But everything, doesn't matter who it is, me or anyone else, what, what I'm saying up here needs to be tested against the word of God. This is our, there, there we have two sources of truth. And the one source is this written word. The second source of truth is the Holy Spirit. Jesus said he would send the host the Holy Spirit and he would guide us into all truth. Okay? So we have two sources of truth. So those are the two sources that everyone has to rely on. We cannot rely on what somebody else thinks. That's one of the biggest things that I want to encourage you about and that I would pass on from what I've learned over 42 years of walking with the Lord. Now, I, I'm not going to go into a lot of descriptions about what happened uh, in my life walking with the Lord. I got some really great high points. I've got some low spots. But, uh, you know, God has seen me through all of it. I mean, I, we had a situation. The one thing, uh, let me say this, because this was pretty miraculous. The one thing that did not pass on the day I was saved was my cigarette habit. 
You know, I smoke the old camels with no filters. <laughs> About a pack a day. And so uh, I got saved and I just kept smoking. Now, I wouldn't smoke at ch around church people. I wouldn't smoke at church, you know, and I tried to avoid any of that so that I wouldn't be bothering anybody. But I still had the habit. And I realized during the first few months of my walk with the Lord that I needed to get rid of this habit. So I was trying to quit. And I was trying unsuccessfully. I tried cold turkey. I tried weaning myself gradually. I tried a lot of different things. And nothing really happened. But then in January of 1978, Billy Graham had a crusade come here. And a uh, picture of Mary and I are on the cover of his magazine or the picture of Las Vegas. I don't know how they managed to get our picture, but we, got, we made the cover <laughs> of that crusade. But in the crusade, I volunteered. And you would go in like 4 o'clock in the afternoon and pray for the success of the crusade. And then around 5, they'd start bringing people in for the meeting that started at 7 and so then you had seating assignments and things that you had to care for. Then the meeting would start for an hour and a half or so until uh, 8.30 or 9 when the audience went out and the people came forward and you went forward and you filled out the cards that they had. And then at the end they'd gather up all the cards and we'd go to the back room then and sort out all the cards so they could be distributed to local pastors for follow-up, Okay. So all of this took like from 4 o'clock in the afternoon, 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> you know? So I'd be in there with no smokes all that time. So I walked out at the convention center here before it was expanded. And I walked out in the parking lot, you know, where nobody was at 10 o'clock at night. And I pulled out a cigarette lit up because I hadn't had one for so long. I was needing one. And when I took the first, inhaled the first smoke off of it, my head got really light, I got really lightheaded. And I knew that my body was already trying to kick off the, the, the smoke, you know, the nicotine habit. And that was a sensation you get. So I said, Lord, wouldn't this be a great time just to remove this from me? I mean, my, I'm already hours into it. Why don't we just call it quits right here, you know? Just remove this from me. And the Lord started speaking to my heart. And he said this. He said, why are you worried about smoking? Which kind of surprised me. So I explained all the reasons I shouldn't smoke to God. <laughs> and he said, well, don't you know that I love you whether you smoke or not? And I said, well, that's pretty obvious. You saved me the way you saved me and everything demonstrated how much you loved me. And I smoked all that time. He goes, don't you know I'm going to use you whether you smoke or not? And I said, well, yeah, I've already had the privilege of leading several people to the Lord, and so I know you are going to use me. He said, so what are you worried about? And I said, well, if, if you put it that way, I guess I'll quit worrying about it. He said, good, let's, I have one question. He said, if somebody that you knew the smoking bothered came and stayed at your house with you, would you not smoke while they're there? And I said, well, of course I, I wouldn't smoke while they were there. He said, good, smoking bothers me. <laughs> and when he said smoking bothers me, the scripture entered my mind that said he will never leave me or forsake me, right? I took the cigarettes out in the trash can. I said, as long as you're here, Lord, I'm not going to smoke, okay? <laughs> now, we give that applause to God because, again, I had nothing to do with it, right? He took it away because from that moment forward, I never had that <laughs> nagging feeling that I had to have a cigarette. I never got the shakes because I had to have a cigarette. I never got anything. The smell left. The habit left. Everything that was associated with the cigarettes left in that moment, and I never smoked another cigarette after that. But it was not, again, not my doing. It was what God did in me. I just got to participate. Isn't that great? I get to, we get to participate in these things that God is doing. Will do. And I know there's some of you who have those kind of testimonies too that God has done great things for you. 
Okay, but I wanted to say that because that was a huge deliverance. So I know what deliverance is. Okay. <clears throat> so on uh, May 5th of 1978, I wound up uh, marrying uh, Mary Stevens, who became Mary Allen, and uh, we started our life together. Now, <clears throat> you know, I, you'd love to say, well, we had the perfect marriage for 38 years, right? <laughs> but it wasn't. And there were ups and downs. We had some real struggles. We had some great successes together in the Lord. One of the things that we found out early in our walk was about tithing, and we became faithful tithers. And I'm telling you, I've had some major attacks on my finances early on, not lately, but when I first started making the decision about tithing, I had some major attacks on my finances that looks like I was going to completely lose my jobs, that there wouldn't be any money coming in on a couple of different occasions, and God saw us through it all. We never suffered loss of anything over months of time, okay? And God saw us through it all. And I can attribute that to our faithfulness in tithing because God has made that promise to us. And that's the one thing he says we can test him. And I, we tested him and he proved himself true, faithful. So the same thing is true today. I don't have, I mean, I'm not rich. Uh, you know, I don't have a lot of money uh, to spend or give away, but I have more than enough than I need. And so my finances are stable because of it, and I believe that it's because God is true to his word when it comes to giving. Okay, so one of the things that uh, brought that about was Mary's intervention about figuring out how to give because we used to get paid on Tuesday or Wednesday and go pay the bills and buy the groceries, and by Sunday we didn't have 10% left to give. So what she started doing was giving the 10% on Tuesday, at least taking it out of the checking account, and then we go spend all the money and everything, and so at the end of the week we had a check for the 10% and gave it. And we never run short. We always had everything we needed. It, I don't know how that worked because before we only bought what we needed and didn't have enough to tithe. Afterwards we tithe first and then we had plenty to get what we needed. You see what I mean? And so we developed that habit. We saw it happening immediately. So uh, I told you we were married on May 5th, 1978, and Mary went home to be with the Lord on May 5th, uh, 2016, 38 years later. So during the last 15 years of our marriage, I would say this, that God showed me ways of demonstrating love in my marriage that I never even imagined before. And so it really changed the dynamic, the last part of our marriage together, it really changed the dynamic of that. You know, there were times uh, when I started going the wrong direction, and uh, the one thing, again, God is faithful, and it's always been what God does, not what I do. Because when I would head out and make the decision to do something that's not right and move in the wrong direction, it was I, the only way I can describe it is running headlong into a cement wall. Boom, brick wall, bam. And he would stop me, turn me around and say, this is where you need to be and where you need to be going. And I would go turn and go back and it would change everything. Okay, so God has always been the one that implemented everything. And I've never been the one who did anything to participate. We had great times. I was a scout leader for 17 years. We had programs in the scouting pro. Uh, thing that they allowed me to do for Christians and we'd preach the gospel and kids would get saved and <laughs> at, up at the Boy Scout camp and stuff like that. So there were some great things that God did uh, for us in those years. So um, I, I mean I could talk for an hour just about all of those things. But in, in the uh, for the benefit of time I'm going to slow it down here. Now
first off, if, if I get to partake, uh, pass on anything that uh, I, I would say you need to know that I learned. And some of these things I learned kind of the hard way. And <clears throat> one of the things is, is that when I finally got to a place where I really, really, really believed that God was who he said he is, it changed everything. I mean, I mean, I, you know, I could tell you that God was omniscient. I could tell you that God was, was faithful. I could tell you that God loved me. I could tell you a lot of things about God. But coming to an understanding that it's really, really, really true changed everything about the way I acted after that. I'll give you an example. I used to mess up. Uh, uh, is there anybody? I know there's a lot of you that never sin, but I, 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 I do it every once in a while. And so when I would happen, I would go, oh, man, I did this. This is wrong. And first off, I'm sure it was the devil. enemy would say, you know, if you whispered in my ear, if you were a Christian, you wouldn't have done that. You know, you wouldn't be acting this way. And and then I'd be going, oh, man, I disappointed God, and I'm beating myself up. And sometimes I could go three or four days doing that, you know, three or four days. Now, I knew the word said in 1 John 1, 9 that, uh, that I mean, in, in Romans 8, 1, there, there's no condemnation for those. Who, I knew the verse was there. I knew that it said that if I confess my sins, he's faithful and just to forgive me my sins and cleanse me from all. I knew all of that, Okay. But I didn't really believe God was who he said he was, see. But when I started really believing God who, who is who he said he was, that meant that didn't matter what I did, there was never, under any circumstances, any condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You mean even when I sin? <laughs> Guess what, folks? <laughs> That's the reason he died on the cross. So there would be no condemnation. Well, if I confess my sins, he's faithful and just to forgive me? Absolutely. And then the Holy Spirit says, well, how long does it take for him to forgive you? A week? A day? An hour? And I went, okay, as soon as the words pass my lips, I'm forgiven. Okay? So once you start grasping that God really is, means what he says, he's who he is, all of this changes. There's no condemnation. So if I mess up, I'm instantly, I made a habit. And these, there are habits that are good to have, you know. And then some of them are, the second you see you're in the wrong, turn to God and confess and start telling yourself. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Telling yourself, Second uh, Corinthians, it says, was it 521? He who knew no sin became sin on my behalf that I might become the righteousness of God in him. Okay, so if I'm the righteousness of God in Christ, when I mess up, do you quit becoming the righteousness of God? Did you have anything for, to do with you becoming the righteousness of God? No, well, then you, didn't have, you can't have anything to do with getting rid of it. Now, can you mess up during those times? Yes, you can. But God has the way to handle it, and you just got to believe that God means what he says, and he is who he says he is. Okay, so he's faithful. That's something that Brian, I was going to go a little deeper into that, but I'm going to leave it because Brian really covered it well. God is faithful. Whatever he says he's going to do, he's going to do. You can count on it with your life, okay? You can count on it with your life. All right. So the biggest issue that we have, I think, in the church today is how we feel about things. And I hate to tell you this, but it has nothing to do with how you feel. It only has to do with what God says. Do I feel like I'm a failure? It's not what God says about me. God says I'm a child of God. God says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? God says 
that all things work together for the good of those that love God and are called according to his purposes. So it doesn't matter what my feelings say. What matters is what God says in his word. So we got to start understanding that when all those feelings rush in on us and make us feel bad, turn us away, none of that's from God. God has feelings. Yes, he gives us great feelings. But he never asks you to rely on your feelings for the truth. You are only two sources of truth, remember? The written word of God and the Holy Spirit. Okay, almost done. And then the last verse I want to show you is Romans 12, 2. This is the other thing that's really important. And Romans 12, 2 says, well, let me read it from here. If I get the right page. <laughs> and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So... There's, there's a difference between being conformed and transformed. You know, when, they, uh, when you put a turkey in the oven and you put the aluminum foil on it, you press it down, the aluminum foil is conformed to the shape of the turkey, right? It doesn't become the turkey. <laughs> Transformation means you're becoming something different. It means you're, it's the word metamorphosis, like a butterfly changing. It's something that basically changes in you, okay? So confirmation is what the world tries to press upon us. Transformation is what God gives us through the renewing of our mind, through the, script, the truth from the scripture and the Holy Spirit. Okay, so I can't tell you how important it is that no matter how, even, my, even after 42 years, I got renewal and transformation that needs to keep taking place in me. So there's none of us that don't, don't, don't need this. So it's a constant process that we need to pay attention to and be aware that the world is trying to conform us and God wants us transformed instead. So those are the things. That's the testimony. And what I would say to you now is, if you're ever in the service like today and you hear the excitement that goes on in the worship time and you're wondering about that, after you've heard all of the testimonies over the last, how many has been, six weeks or so, you know why we get excited because you know where God brought us from and how he got us to where we are now. That's exciting, something to get excited about, folks. It's something to get excited that God would make that kind of a change in a person's life. So if you're not there where you're getting excited, I want you to join us. I think excitement is not only catching, it's a really great thing to have in your life, especially when you're getting excited about transformation and not confirmation. <laughs>